My name's Adele Onyango and welcome to another episode of Legally Clueless. No, seriously, I have no clue what I'm doing, but I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one. Hey you, welcome to this episode of Legally Clueless Podcast and this is what's coming up a little later. He lost control and uh, our matter too rolled, uh, I don't know, several times. So again, I usually, I wonder, all this was happening. Of course, I know that the passengers in the vehicle, there must be people who are screaming or maybe some unrest, but I don't know how I cannot recall any of that. Eight people lost their lives and uh, Masi was among the eight. Apart from the eight who uh, lost their lives on the spot, so that means uh, we we were three survivors, but um, unfortunately among the three, the two also lost their lives while undergoing medication in hospital. Speaking today, I'm the only survivor of the road accident. If you are an OG member, thank you so much for being part of the family. If you're new here, audio episodes go out every Monday and Wednesdays. And we have on our website four seasons of a tour series and a video series that you need to watch like yesterday. And while you're there, you can sign up to join our community and receive our newsletter. In fact, one went out last week. It was all about quitting alcohol. So (laughs) if you're joining the bandwagon, please sign up for that newsletter because I intend to share my alcohol quitting journey with you and a lot of other good stuff. So yeah, the link to that is in the show notes. And while you're there, if you've always wanted to share your story on this podcast, fill out the storyteller form and we'll get back to you. Ooh, I always keep forgetting our cozy corner of the internet is Instagram. You can find us at Legally Clueless Africa. We're also on TikTok, Legally Clueless Africa as well. Again, all of those links are in the show notes. So I truly hope that you are doing well. We've gotten to the middle of the year. I don't even know how fast this happened, but here we are. And we just need to be grateful that we've seen six months, right? Just grateful for life. I feel like later on this week, I'll either talk to you about anxiety or leadership. (laughs) So in case I don't talk about anxiety in the Wednesday episode, let me just share a bit here. So I kind of became sloppy with the foods I eat that help keep my anxiety in check and the foods I avoid that just fuck up my anxiety. So for example, for the longest time, I have been off of coffee because it just like spikes my anxiety. But when I went to Ethiopia in April, of course, I had to try the coffee ritual traditional thing (laughs) where they you know they make the coffee and they roast it there and they put it in the jibena I think that's what it's called and it just tasted so beautiful I didn't have too much I think I did that coffee ritual twice or coffee ceremony twice and I never experienced any effects of anxiety and I was like "Ooh, maybe it's because this one is you know legit (laughs) when I came back my close friend He likes this latte something something and he's slowly been introducing it to me. Every time I go to his house, he's like, oh, I'm going to make us lattes and it's kind of like this mixed hot drink that tastes so delicious. And I remember like the first time being like, does this thing have caffeine? And he's like, I don't know. I don't know. And we just kind of like breezed over it. And I've been very reckless and I just kept having so much of it. I also have not for like, let's say two, three weeks even had my hibiscus juice or tea, which I realized really helps me. I also started mixing a bit of turmeric in it because turmeric is a spice that helps reduce anxiety. So much so I remember when I was back on radio and my anxiety was terrible. I used to walk around with like a little pouch of turmeric powder that I could just instantly mix with warm water. Hey, things were thick. (laughs) Things were thick. Anyway, so I kind of like became lazy to keep up all of those strict measures. Last week, I had like the craziest bout of anxiety and it didn't help that it was right before my period, which is a time that already my emotions are just weird. And it, it was bad. And I had a speaking engagement And I just 
I remember sitting on this panel and when I started talking, I could hear my voice shake and I was just like, what's happening? This is, this is not me. And my gut was just like in a rut, you know, like just air pockets. And it had been so long since I'd felt anxiety that I didn't know. <laughs> like, it's like I couldn't remember what it was. For a while, I was like, am I falling sick? You know, trying to think, what could be the issue? I, my period was pretty late. <laughs> had a bit of a scare. <laughs> it was pretty late. And I think on the podcast, I've shared about going to see my gyna because I had a bit of a scare earlier this year. And so I know I was anxious about that. So when my period was late, I was like, oh my goodness, did we fix the issue? Or is it back? Or like, what's happening? Where are my periods? And so I was like, is it that? Am I sick? Like, should I just book an emergency appointment with my gyna? And at the end of the day on Monday, <laughs> I was sitting in the car and I was like, you know what? I am going to get myself some traditional luo vegetable that I love and some ugali, which is, it's like pap in Southern Africa or fufu in Western Africa, I think. Anyway, and I was just like, I'm just going to like eat traditional, like something is off. And then... As I'm driving to the restaurant where I get this traditional food, I just remember, hang on, I know this feeling. <laughs> I know this bitch. Her name is Anxiety. Why is she back? Oh my goodness. So the funny thing is, like a switch, as soon as I recognized all the signs and all the symptoms, and I was like, how could I forget? Like I've, I've lived this anxiety life for I don't know how long as soon as I figured out what it was everything started like coming down everything started coming down but it was so uncomfortable but it was just so uncomfortable so now I'm really going back to being strict <laughs> I even like stopped all my other teas I was only having hibiscus teas because you know these like other teas have like a little bit of caffeine in it but hibiscus I like boil and brew it myself i boil the the flowers like the petals of the hibiscus flower like the dried petals i'll boil it i'll add ginger i'll add turmeric if i'm feeling fancy i'll add honey if i'm feeling like i don't want to waste money i'll just add sugar <laughs> but then now i'm going back to that like hey hey guys <laughs> it has been tough and i felt it again last night into today but it's kind of calmed down you know and what I hate about the moments when I'm going through high levels of anxiety first and foremost my anxiety is diagnosed and when I'm going through those heightened moments of it I start doubting everything I'm doing oh my goodness and you know there's already so much as an entrepreneur there's already so much like you're doubting so for example like we need to roll out our east africa tour series you know and we're waiting on approvals from our partner and uh, we partnered with an organization to do it and so there's been delays that i didn't foresee and so in the state of anxiety i'm just like look you can't even manage that which is like false like these things are beyond my control control so there's that i'm working on a poetry film i'll give you more details soon i'm still like i can't believe this is happening and so i'm just like hey are you sure you can do this man anxiety just comes in and just like sprinkles a healthy dose of self-doubt on everything i'm doing and it's just been such a long time since i felt it that it's almost more disruptive and so I'm trying to ride the wave. It is manageable. I feel like today, yesterday into today has been a lot more manageable than last Monday. Last Monday, I was comatose. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just kind of like whew, trying to take it easy. I don't know why I'm just opening up about that to you. Like, I feel like I've made you my therapist. <laughs> Please send your invoice. <laughs> Bill me, bill me, please. Okay, you know what? I think we need to jump into our story today. And it's quite a heavy story. It does deal with grief. And so just a trigger warning for you. And it's Seraphine's very powerful story. Honestly, I'm not going to go too much into it because I wanted to talk about it afterwards. But essentially, it's a story of being the sole survivor in an accident. 
A hundred African stories on Legally Clueless. Stories from Africa. My name is Seraphine Santana, born and raised in the western part of Kenya, Bungoma County. I'm a lawyer lady. Transitioning from my child to an adult, there's been a lot going on. You can say that uh, in campus, when you get to campus, you're, you're a little bit uh, grown up. And uh, during that time in campus, you also make friends, you know. And this kind of friends are the people you want to maintain that friendship with all your life, actually, because you're grown-ups. In campus, I made such kind of friends. I had one. She was called Marcy. Today, as I speak about her, it's sad or unfortunate that uh, I can't talk to her or can't see her anymore because... uh, She lost, uh, we lost her um, eight years ago. May she rest well. Yeah, but uh, she's uh, among the kind of friends I wanted to spend uh, the rest of my life with. uh, Because, uh, you know, there are some friends you make and uh, you feel like uh, you're clicking a lot with uh, that uh, set of connection you're uh, having with that friend. She was one of them. uh, It's eight years and uh, it's still fresh in my mind, like, uh, she just went yesterday, but yeah, may she continue resting well. Uh, when I met Mosi, we actually met when we were both in first year in campus. The most common thing that uh, brought us together is that we were both hockey players. And so we actually met in the hockey field. It happens so that a time later we were neighbors because we stayed close to each other. And uh, we just made it, made it a habit that in the evenings when we were going for practice, I had to pass by at her home so that we would go together. Then we'll come back together home uh, after the practice. Uh, we had some uh, other common interests that I want to mention actually, but um, it was not uh, our connection was not actually related to academics because. Uh, What she was studying was totally different from my area of study, so we could never meet in class or something. But uh, outside class, the co-curricular and other activities, we were close to each other. We spent time together also. Either she would come to my place or I go to her place. What I remember most about Masi is that she used to talk a lot. Um, She's this kind of friend uh, whom you would never actually be bored to spend time with her because she would talk again and again and uh, she used to laugh a lot. I miss that too, yeah, because uh, her laugh was, uh, I don't know, contagious. I don't know if it is a coincidence or what, but uh, the last day of Marcy's life, we were together. It was during our second year in campus, during the campus elections, you know, the politics and stuff. There was a little uh, disagreement between some candidates and uh, the elections board because of the results. And uh, this actually led to a student unrest. There was a strike. Actually, that led to the school being closed indefinitely. Okay, on that day, I remember very well because uh, I had a class that morning. But I skipped class that morning because I had to make my hair. I went to the salon. At that time while I was in the salon, then uh, some moment later we started uh, hearing a lot of uh, noise from the outside. And people were running up and down. The tear gas, also some little gunshots. This actually, it raised a concern to us who were in the salon. We really wanted to know what was going on. So nobody was, uh, nobody had the guts to open that uh, door and uh, check with what was going on outside there. After a few moment, uh, a few after a few minutes, uh, uh, someone knocked on the door, and uh, she was actually seeking for a place where she could uh, at least find some rest because she's she had been running all along from school. So uh, when she got in, she narrated the whole uh, episode of the story and what was going on in the school. By the time I was done with the salon and everything was calm and back to normal, I was walking back to m- my house when 
I passed by Marcy and uh, some other friends who were narrating everything about uh, the strike and uh, how everything went down. Oh, sorry, I have not mentioned that. I studied at Chuka University. Yeah, so uh, when I got to them, out of uh, curiosity, I asked questions that I had to ask about the strike. Well, uh, still conversing with them, we rece- we actually got a notification from the school that uh, the school was uh, closed down indefinitely. And uh, so every student was supposed to go home until uh, the time when it would be communicated for us to go back to school. Later in the evening that same day, I actually had a, a conversation with Marcy, the, the usual, like we usually we did on WhatsApp, and uh, we were talking about... Uh, actually, she was asking me about when I would uh, be traveling home uh, because uh, she wanted uh, us to travel together. And so we actually came into agreement that uh, we were traveling home the following day, early in the morning, because uh, actually it was quite a distance from school to home. Okay, Masi, she came from Eldoret. I also... Uh, at that time, my dad was also working there at Eldoret. So I had to pass by at my dad's. Since it happened that we were going to the same place, uh, we agreed that uh, we would travel together. They had to wake up early the following morning for that because it was roughly 8 to 10 hours to have a journey. So that night I packed my bag and everything. The following morning when I, I woke up, you know, I'm usually punctual at the time, especially when my alarm goes off. I wake up, I don't snooze, I don't shut it down or what. My alarm went off in the morning, I woke up. You know, I had already estimated uh, roughly I needed 30 minutes to prepare and everything so that uh, after that uh, we would be on the road. So after I was done, I went to uh, pick Mercy so that we would go together, but I arrived at a place she was not ready. So actually today I usually regret to some extent and then like um okay when i got to her place she was not ready and uh, she even told me oh you can just go and then uh, we shall meet later but i insisted and told her that uh, you know i can wait for you because uh, we're supposed to travel together so you just hurry i hurried up her actually usually regret because I say that uh, maybe if I wouldn't have hurried her and uh, let her stay then uh, that means she would uh, not have traveled with me and uh, yeah maybe what happened wouldn't have happened and uh, maybe today I would still be laughing with her. So when we left sir, and boarded uh, Matatu it was headed to Nairobi from Chuka to Nairobi, and that's a travel of uh, approximately three hours. We, it was just a smooth journey uh, with nothing much, and uh, as I mentioned, Mercy talked a lot, she laughed a lot. Yeah, so that's what we did, actually. We were literally making noise to every other passenger in the vehicle. When you got to Nairobi, so we actually were supposed to get another vehicle that would take us to Eldoret. We went, um, actually, I'm the one who suggested to her because it was the vehicle company that I'm used to traveling with. I told her, okay, let's go and uh, see if we'll find a matatu. So we went to Mfangano to get uh, North Rift. When we got there, apparently there was a huge traffic over travelers so we had to actually queue to get a matatu that, that meant that uh, we were not going to leave nairobi immediately we had to wait so we waited for close to four hours before the matatu that we booked arrived when we boarded the matatu the same continued we were just talking and laughing mind you the previous uh, weekend we had uh, been at embu university for some uh, inter-campus games. So we were majorly talking about that, you know, there was a lot to talk about. I recall when we arrived at uh, Naivasha, you know, my, okay, my dad is uh, this kind of 
a person when I used to travel, he he was called me again and again to check on me and where I had reached. So uh, when we arrived at Naivasha, he called me again. I told him, uh, yeah, we are at Naivasha. And um, actually, immediately after that call, Masi suggested, and I will quote what uh, she told me. Sarah, we have been traveling like from Chuka all the way. And remember, we are tired. So what about uh, we go to sleep and then um, when uh, the vehicle stops at Nakuru, we shall wake up there. And uh, yeah, I agreed. So while we, we were sleeping, that is when uh, um, we experienced uh, an incident that, uh, yeah, I think that was the last moment of us being together. Sadly, I can never tell what exactly happened, but it's a story that I was told, like something that was uh, recorded down from the witnesses and all that. I never witnessed it, but I, I don't know, maybe it was just erased from my memory. Okay, this is what I was told happened. Well, we were, we arrived at Gilgil, a few a few kilometers from Gilgil town. On our route, there was a matatu ahead of us. Then we were like right behind it, and then uh, from the opposite direction came um, another matatu and uh, a bus behind it. The bus driver was trying to overtake. And, uh, you know, he was uh, speeding up because, okay, he seemed to be in a rush. He uh, went head on collision with the, the matatu that was ahead of us. And uh, yeah, this matatu actually it came and uh, hit our matatu as well. And uh, our driver was trying to uh, control the situation, it was just beyond his. Uh, control and so he lost control and uh, our matatu rolled uh, i don't know several times so again i usually i wonder if all this was happening of course i know that the passengers in the vehicle there must be people who are screaming or maybe some unrest but i don't know how i cannot recall any of that it was uh, confirmed that uh, eight people lost their lives and uh, Masi was among the eight and uh, until today I usually wonder I was I was actually sitting close to her however I cannot remember uh, which seat in the vehicle we were sitting on how did she not survive and uh yeah, you know such kind of questions that the ones i ask myself because later after approximately two months it's when i got out of, out of hospital apart from the eight who uh lost their lives on the spot so that means uh we we were three survivors but um, unfortunately among the three the two also lost their lives while undergoing medication in hospital and so uh speaking today i'm the only survivor of the road accident uh from the matatu and so um <clears throat> see i was actually lucky enough because uh uh despite everything happening my phone was not crashed my phone did not go off so actually my dad kept calling and uh okay i was not picking up the call because it was reported that uh, i was unconscious so he kept calling until uh luckily someone picked up the call and uh told my dad what had happened and so that's when he came all the way from Eldoret. And uh, upon arrival, actually, there was a little confusion because, you know, you get someone unconscious and uh, covered with blood all over. No. So before uh, the doctor confirmed anything, he thought I was also dead. Yeah. 
but after a few minutes it was confirmed that I was still breathing but I was just unconscious in a coma that's when I was actually transferred from the hospital uh, to a different one in Nakuru town where I was uh, placed in ICU I spent uh, three weeks in ICU and when someone is in ICU you're not sure if this person will wake up mostly it's usually expected that you're going to die yeah many had lost hope in in me i woke up from that bed after getting out of icu i was in a ward for again uh, a month all that same will i was in the hospital every other person my friends and everyone else were allowed to visit me and so i was laying in a, in the bed but I, I don't know why. I can't recall what happened. I used to ask the people who visited me, but nobody ever told me. I was just told, you are sick, but no further explanation. At that same, okay, that ward I was in, there was uh, a mirror. Anytime I would turn and face the mirror, I would see scars on my face, on my head. Okay, my, my hair was even shaved and I had big scars on my head. And then, apart from that, I had uh, a bandage on my left arm. The right, right side of my body felt numb. I could barely wake up to sit on the bed. I only laid down. I, I was very weak. I could see uh, big big scars on my on my stomach but nobody ever explained anything to me until the time when when i recovered was discharged from hospital actually i could not walk on my own i had to have someone support me or just maybe sit on a wheelchair and have someone push me so when i got home that's when I got my phone back. All this time while I was in hospital, uh, my phone was taken away from me, so I could not even communicate with anyone. So my mom gave my phone to me. I switched it on, and the uh, first thing, when I checked my WhatsApp, I was actually added in uh, close to five WhatsApp groups, and uh, all the groups had the same, like, Similar title, R.I.P. Rest in peace. So, I was even shocked. What really happened that people thought I was dead? I had the, the WhatsApp groups for all that. I was curious to know, but I couldn't ask my parents or even my siblings because I said, if at all, I've been with them for two months. And uh, nobody ever told me anything. How sure am I that if I ask today, they are going to tell me? I actually decided to ask one friend. He was actually a mutual friend to me and Marcy. I asked him just to give me an explanation about what had happened to me because I barely knew anything. He told me everything. He is actually the first person who told me about the accident and, and uh, even Marcy's death. Until today, I'm usually uh, bothered by the fact that I was not there during her burial. When she was getting uh, laid to rest, I was I was still in ICU, so I could not attend her burial. I usually wish at least I was there for that, but yeah. So after all that was explained to me, so when I, I actually called my mom to my room and uh, I actually pretended that I knew nothing and I asked her what had happened and uh, before she could tell, tell me anything she actually broke into tears it got me a little confused but she actually uh, told me exactly the same thing my other friend had told me before so the okay the accident happened uh, on 9th February 2016 me being in hospital and this uh, discharge and recovery that was uh, now april and so 
remember the school had been closed indefinitely and so in in may 2016 it was communicated that uh, we were resuming our studies i i actually had uh, healed i could uh, walk i felt that i had recovered fully and so i told my parents that i wanted to go back to school they knew i was not okay but i thought i was okay and so after i insisted much yeah they let me go back to school i went back and uh, since i had known what had transpired i had uh, all sorts of uh, sympathy encounters from literally almost everyone in school everyone i met was sorry sorry and all that until one day well uh, we were actually in school i remember that day very well because it was during this time when we were sitting for our cuts so that day we were going in for our a, a cut and uh, i was actually out of the examination room with my classmates as we were waiting for the time to reach while we were talking and everything suddenly i was distracted by thoughts because honestly all along while i was in school i was never okay any time that i sat alone i had a lot dozens of thoughts in my mind that bothered me uh, that is it's it has to do with the PTSD at this time we were actually on the 6th floor of that building so when when i got distracted with the thoughts i actually moved away from the people i was talking to my classmates i moved a distance from them and uh, I went to the corner of the balcony stood there and uh, actually at that moment I had suicidal thoughts because I was like I don't see any meaning of life anymore if I lost my best friend and uh, I have to live a life where I won't see her again and so it bothered me a lot I thought maybe also losing my life and joining how was the best and nothing else so i was on the verge of jumping from the building one of my classmates he came to where i was and asked me if i was okay and uh, i only my answer was okay today if i jump from here by the time i get to the floor so that will kill me that is what i asked him since they knew what i was going through he raised an alarm i was taken from there to the dean of students office so that uh, i could get at least some uh, guidance on uh, what to do next so while in the dean's office that's when i was actually introduced to one lady who was in the guiding and counseling department and uh, actually i talked to her opened up about everything that i had been feeling and uh, actually it felt better after i spoke to her because uh, i felt like uh, I had released a heavy load of my shoulder after I talked to her that's when uh, they reached out to my my dad I had to actually de- defer my studies because it was evident that I was not fully recovered my dad uh, he actually uh, came to school the following day to pick me up because uh, i actually couldn't travel on my own i still had that that fear in me so i could not travel on my own that's when immediately my mom because she she knew someone who i could talk to my mom reached out to a counselor and uh, immediately I started going for therapy it took me close to 5 months before i could feel like i was okay before i could talk about my story without uh, breaking down yeah the the counseling really helped a lot it's during that period that 
I came to understand everything happens for a reason. There is a reason why I survived and, and came out of the accident alive. I am not to blame for anything, even for the loss of my best friend's life. But uh, today I can uh, speak about this incident. And uh, I just don't speak about it because... I'm seeking sympathy from anyone, but my reason why I decided to uh, come out and speak about this is because I felt like this, this is a testimony. Be speaking out to everyone. I know that there are so many victims of road accidents. Maybe my voice could be one of the helpers they need you will find that the victims of fraud accidents today who uh, actually under trauma but i feel like if i speak and my voice reach, reaches to them at least they will get out of that point of despair feel like uh, get encouraged that if at all I survived and if they also survived then it means that uh, sometimes negative things will happen to you in life but it should not actually discourage you there's a reason as to why it happens to you but you should uh, learn from it gather strength let it build you to be uh, someone someone different yeah that's what i can say so me speaking about the incident that i encountered despite it being sad but i know that it encourages a lot of people catch more african stories in the next episode of legally clueless oh my goodness i feel like out of the over 300 stories i have recorded this story really made me introspect on a whole other level my heart really goes out to seraphine and just i can't imagine all of those years ago being in campus and navigating losing your friend and the craziest part about grief is like when you lose somebody who's part of your everyday routine and you have to go into spaces, so like in her case, like classes or restaurants where you used to have lunch or if you use the bus together, you know what I mean? So if you have to go through those spaces now without them, it's just like the, it's like you feel like death is mocking you, you know, when you're in those spaces. And I just can't imagine how she navigated that. I think I also just, the bit that broke my heart is her being in hospital and not knowing what was happening and kind of like getting her phone and seeing all this RIP WhatsApp groups or WhatsApp groups for like raising funds. Can you imagine being in hospital for months and not knowing why you're in there? That must be so frustrating. And I'm not blaming anyone because, you know, I was thinking about it while listening to her is like when you're going to visit someone and it's so traumatic, it's an accident, her best friend is dead. You may not know what to say or how to say it. You know what I mean? And it's just like my heart really does just... Oh, this is one of the stories like I will never forget this one. And, you know, it just really made me introspect on how fickle life is. We truly think we will all automatically see tomorrow, like honestly, or maybe even tomorrow that we're going to see the next 10 minutes. Right. When I was listening to Seraphine's story, I thought of my best friend and for those of you who've listened to the podcast for a while, you know, I cry very easily. <laughs> And like the thought of him dying just made me tear up because I just, I just can't imagine how difficult it'll be grieving him. This is something I've told him <laughs> that he's not allowed to die first. <laughs> of course, I know I have no control over it or whatever, but I'm just like, please, if maybe if your ancestors here, you just tell them Adele has to die first, <laughs> not you, because I just, I, how do you moan a friend i like even now just thinking about it like makes me want to start crying and i have lashes on so i'm not gonna 
I'm not going to go down that road. But it honestly, listening to the story, it made me really think long and hard. And even about the things like, you know, you disagree about the small things you disagree about in friendships. Because I'm not saying, oh, because, you know, your friend might die now just like accept any shenanigans. But like, you know, there's things you maybe find irritating (laughs) about your friend or you argue or disagree with your friend about something and like listen to this story I was just like are those things even important I think we didn't have an argument but like he irritated me a few days ago and I'm just like now was that why was that necessary (sighs) we really don't speak about the intimacy of friendships and how death can in that setting, gift you a lifetime of grieving that friend. And you know, the thing is, <laughs> sorry, I'm going on and on because this story really, really touched me. The thing is, the older I get, the more I understand how in some situations, your friends can even be closer to you than your family. And your friends can know you better than your family. It's sequel by a, like no shade or whatever these are things that can be true and you can find that you feel safer amongst friends or a friend than say with your family it happens more often than we'd like to admit and so if your friend dies and the worst thing is like even the guilt survivor's guilt because in her situation it's an accident Everyone dies but you. And the everyone includes your friends. I don't know. I just kept wondering, how do you navigate that? How do you navigate the complex feelings that come with that? Whew. Anyway, I would love to hear your thoughts on the story. What did you connect with? Because it really made me introspect. Did it make you think about something? Did it make you co- more conscious of how fickle life is like it did for me? Let me know in the comment section of whatever platform you're listening to this on. And while you're doing that, I would like to send some love to some of the people who've left comments. You know, last week we had the episode that was on unpacking a father and a mother wound. And I asked you to describe your relationship with your parents in one word. Jose, you said blessed with my mom, distance with my dad. Tracy Nalyaka, you just said, wow, I highly relate. You're the full of real exams. <laughs> yes, the question. <laughs> Angie, you say one word to describe my relationship with my mom, intentional. I love that. Val Quena, you say triggering and dope episode. Relationship with my mom, amazing. Relationship with the other parent, non-existent in caps lock. Afro Bandit, ooh, I love your name. You say so brave of Linda to tell her story. There's so much power in having control of your narrative. Lots of healing as well. Absolutely true. Nobody can shame you. Own your story, own your mistakes, own every part of your journey. Junior, you just dropped one word and you say difficult. I'm sending you love, Junior. I hope with time you're able to navigate it, you know, and come to a resolution. I don't mean like kumbaya with your parents. I mean a resolution internally as yourself in terms of how the situation affects you. And then there's Eve who says, I hope when she's ready, she'll start the process of healing. She's been strong for so long. It would be great to get some professional help. Great episode. I can relate. I get you. Everybody has their timing for when they start their intentional healing journey. But yeah, I, since I am on that journey, Highly recommend it for everybody. Okay, if you want to share your story on this podcast, remember you can fill out the storyteller form and we will get back to you. Stories are picked at random, so just be patient with us. If you're in the East African region, catch us on Trace FM Monday and Wednesday. We're there at 1 p.m. and 11 p.m. Fridays, we're there at 1 p.m. And you can stream on traceradio.co.ke. And I'm going to leave you with great news. Okay, group therapy sessions are resuming this month of June. So make sure you follow our Instagram and make sure you also sign up for a newsletter because we're about to announce the dates and it's going to be obviously it's group therapy. So it's very limited and the tickets sell out like in days. Okay. And we've changed up the structure. We're going to keep the same groups of people from June to the end of the year. And what we're going to be navigating is childhood trauma. I feel like we just want to see freer adults. I I find that 
so many of adults are held in bondage and the bondage is really from trauma experienced in childhood. And so from June to December, imagine being part of group therapy that helps you resolve your childhood trauma. We have got a great partner on board. Of course, we have our resident therapist, Faith, who's going to be leading it alongside other therapists as well. We've really been intentional about how we are structuring the group therapy sessions. So make sure you sign up for our newsletter, follow our Instagram so that when we make the announcement of the date, which is later in June, you can be the first to grab your spot. Until Wednesday, (laughs) I'm sending you tons of grace. That's it for this episode of Legally Clueless. You can share this podcast with your friends. You can keep it for yourself. I'm not judging. Just make sure you're here next week for the next episode.